Hi, it's Katrina. The Japanese Reptile Temple. The Horyuji Nara Temple is one of the most mysterious historical places in Japan. It seems like a perfectly ordinary temple, only it was once home to a weird reptilian statue. Some say the reptilian statue is direct evidence of another advanced race having once visited Earth, likely from somewhere beyond the stars. The temple itself was once one of the seven great temples in Ikaruga, founded in 607 by Prince Shotoku. Rumor has it that 1400 years ago, the prince had an encounter with a lizard creature from outer space. Following the encounter, the prince had a statue built in the reptile's honor and placed it inside the temple. The statue truly does look like someone from a race of lizard-like humanoids. It has ordinary arms and legs, its body is shaped just like any man, but its head is that of a humanoid reptile with deep-set eyes and a lizard's mouth. It also appears to be wearing some kind of suit, or at least a piece of armor around its torso. The reptile statue is definitely weird to say the least. However, mysteriously, in 2017, the statue was removed from public view at the Buddhist temple. Since then, nobody knows what's happened to it. Peña de Huayca Peña de Huayca in Colombia has been labeled the most mysterious mountain in the Americas. Thousands of people flock to the mountain every week to witness the UFOs that seem to be drawn to this place like a magnet. It's just outside the city of Bogotá and has been home to the Muisca Indians for hundreds of years. Ancient legend has it that the Muisca Indians worshipped the mountain as a god and even made sacrifices in its honor. Throughout the years, the mountain has seen its fair share of blood. After the days of sacrifices, there was even more death and misery. It was on the slopes of the mountain where the indigenous people fell on their own swords in a final act of dignity before being conquered by Spanish invaders. Some believe the energy of all this death has seeped into Peña de Huayca, making it a place of great power. One of these people is systems engineer William Chavez Ariza, who has been visiting the mountain for over 30 years, studying paranormal phenomenon. William says the aliens are drawn to the mountain inexplicably and that he's seen on multiple occasions plate-shaped lights circulating around the peak. The Evans Culture Mounds At the edge of Monroe, Louisiana, there is an archaeological site that dates back almost 5,400 years. Here you can find 11 massive earthen mounds connected by tall ridges. The site is considered one of the oldest preserved earthworks from the Archaic period in the United States, predating even the Egyptian pyramids and Stonehenge. This mysterious site in Louisiana was constructed by a society of hunters and gatherers known as the Evans Culture. They lived here starting around 3500 BC, and over time they built such an impressive group of structures, archaeologists didn't even believe such a thing was possible. Diana Greenlee, an archaeologist at the University of Louisiana, says nobody thought primitive hunter-gatherers could be so organized or could create such complex structures. These people were hunters, they fished, and they pulled together wild resources. Yet they also built monumental mounds, some of them being 25 feet tall. It took the Evans culture about 700 years to finish their mounds, which makes it one of the longest building projects in history. However, archaeologists don't really understand what purpose the mounds were constructed for. They found all kinds of hidden artifacts here, things like stone beads, bone tools, fish hooks, and an antler used for sharpening stone knives. But why the culture spent seven centuries piling up dirt into huge mounds is still a mystery to this day. The Cockno Stone there is a mysterious place in Scotland hiding an ancient secret. The site doesn't have an official name, but it can be found in West Dunbartonshire. In 1885, Reverend James Harvey accidentally came upon a mysterious stone hiding underneath the grass. He cleared the dirt and shrubs away, revealing what is now considered to be some of the greatest petroglyphs in Britain. The rock art was left on a single gigantic stone in the Bronze Age. The stone measures 42 feet by 26 feet and has 90 carved indentations on it. 
5,000 years ago, a group of early humans walked up the side of the hill, found a nice looking rock, and decided they would cover it in strange markings. They carved spirals, circles, and indecipherable geometric decorations. They then walked away. The stone was forgotten, and grass grew over it until the stone was hidden underneath the hill. Archaeologists still don't know what any of the markings mean. The rock was covered up again in 1965 because the experts were afraid of vandalism. It was uncovered only briefly in 2015 for archaeologists from the University of Glasgow to do a quick investigation. They recorded the markings and tried to make sense of them, but the mystery remains unsolved. San Miguel Ixtapan The site of San Miguel Ixtapan in Mexico is believed to date back to over 3,000 years ago. The site is most famous for its unique megalithic architecture, and the stonework at this ancient place is nothing short of remarkable. The stone slabs used in the construction weren't the biggest or the heaviest blocks of rock, but they were carved with expert precision. The angles and lines are so straight, it's hard to believe that any pre-Columbian civilization could be responsible. San Miguel Ixtapan is one of the few archaeological sites that's been explored in the southwest region of the state of Mexico. Up until quite recently, we had almost no archaeological knowledge of the area. We know that it was a midway point between the people of the central highlands and the cultures in the state of Michoacán. But little is known about the people who lived here. The city had its most successful stage of growth between 750 and 900 AD, then was mysteriously abandoned around 1200 AD. However, many of the creations here are much older, thousands of years older to be exact. Archaeologists discovered stone slabs embedded in the walls of a colonial church in the center of the modern town of San Miguel. These slabs were almost definitely taken from the ancient ruins and incorporated into the church following the occupation of the Spanish. The Spanish had a habit of tearing down ancient temples and structures, then using the blocks to build their own churches and cathedrals. What's really fascinating is that the stonework of these slabs look modern, as if they were machined in a factory using lasers. Whoever lived here before was a highly advanced civilization, but we just don't know who they were to give them credit. A big shout out to Janice and Amanda Banks. Thanks so much for watching and letting us be a part of your day. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. Nagarjuna Konda The historical town of Nagarjuna Konda is in India's Andhra Pradesh state and was an important site for Buddhist learnings in the 4th century AD. However, these days, it's completely flooded and hiding underwater. The ancient Buddhist town was rediscovered in 1926 by a schoolteacher who stumbled upon an ancient pillar. He reported what he found to the government, and archaeologists soon descended on the site and began excavating. They uncovered the ruins of Buddhist stupas, monuments, sculptures, and a huge wealth of Buddhist artifacts. Excavations continued all the way until 1954, when the government decided to build a dam. In 1960, the whole site was flooded before archaeologists could even get all the artifacts out. The researchers had to go underwater to remove the monuments after the flooding, then relocated each piece to the top of a nearby hill. That was where they built a museum in 1966 that was filled with ruins taken out of the water brick by brick. But perhaps the most interesting part of this sunken city is the man whom it was named after. Nagarjuna was a Buddhist philosopher whose name comes up a lot in Buddhist legends. Almost nothing is known about his personal life, at least no concrete details. But historians believe he likely lived in southern India in the 2nd century AD. Buddhist tradition says he lived 400 years after the Buddha reached Nirvana. However, legend also has it that he lived for a whopping 600 years. Whether he lived 600 years or not is doubtful from a scientific standpoint. Still, Nagarjuna was behind the middle way philosophy. He created concepts of emptiness, denying his existence as well as denying his non-existence. He taught that ignorance is the cause of suffering and that everything in the universe exists autonomously and also permanently. Cañada de la Virgen 
Cañada de la Virgen, Spanish for Virgin's Glen, is an ancient archaeological site in the state of Guanajuato, Mexico. It was only recently excavated in 2002, and the public were only allowed access to it in 2011. The archaeological ruins are sitting on private property, so this isn't exactly on the tourist maps. The ancient city is fascinating because it was occupied by a group of people that isn't very well known. They were called the Otomi, and they prospered in the valley of San Miguel de Allende for thousands of years. They built the city of Cañada de la Virgen following the collapse of the mighty culture at Teotihuacan, hundreds of miles to the south near Mexico City. But here's where the mystery really starts. Archaeologists know that the amazing city of Teotihuacan was abandoned somewhere around 750 AD. And interestingly, this was right around the time Cañada de la Virgen was founded. Some scholars believe the Otomi people fled Teotihuacan in its final days, ran as far north as they could, and settled away from what must have been an extremely tumultuous time in the Valley of Mexico. The Otomi people even tried to replicate what had been built at Teotihuacan. They dedicated the site to the moon, the sun, and the planet Venus. They also built huge pyramids that tracked the solstices and other cosmic events. But sadly, just like at Teotihuacan, the Otomi civilization would eventually collapse. They began to decline about 400 years later, and they were completely gone by 1050, and nobody knows why. Halls Hill Lookout Halls Hill Lookout is a strange and unassuming place overlooking the Puget Sound on Bainbridge Island in Washington. It's less than 30 minutes away from downtown Seattle, and yet Halls Hill Lookout has a completely different atmosphere than the big city. It's a place out of time, complete with a mysterious garden based on a 13th century cathedral from France. The garden labyrinth consists of 12 main circles, which were designed to represent the lunar and seasonal cycles. The labyrinth is rich both in Native American symbology and astrological references. And although it's not the biggest labyrinth in the world, nor is it even three-dimensional, some say it has a unique way of letting a person get in touch with their soul. Maneuvering your way through the labyrinth is supposed to happen in three stages. Along the path, one must go through the inward journey, the outward journey, and then there's a spot at the end for deep meditation. The Washington Labyrinth is in the middle of a complex network of paths, stone sculptures, beautiful gardens, and a gigantic Buddhist prayer wheel. If you turn the prayer wheel nine times, it rings a 500-pound bell. The whole place feels ancient, and yet it was created recently by Portland-based artist Jeffrey Bale. Still, Jeffrey got his inspiration from Native American architecture and medieval France. And so the atmosphere of the Halls Hill Lookout is extremely unique for the Pacific Northwest. Karakoto Karakoto, also known as the Black City, is a ruined fortress in the far western region of Inner Mongolia. Founded in 1032 AD, the city was once a center for religious learning, artistic expression, and for trading with merchants from around the globe. It was a stronghold for the Tibeto-Burman Tribal Union, occupying a small stretch of the Silk Road between North China and Central Asia. Everything was going great for about 200 years. Then, in the 13th century, Genghis Khan showed up and made things difficult for the people inhabiting the area. He was forcing the city to send him troops to help bolster his army, and when the city stopped sending men, Genghis Khan showed up with a massive force of 180,000 soldiers. In the year 1226, he conquered the Black City. However, the city didn't die, only its people did. It continued to flourish under Mongol rule until the 14th century. The biggest issue with the city was that for 40 days in every direction, there was nothing but desert and emptiness. It was a city in the middle of absolutely nowhere, with no access to fresh water. The armies of Ming China marched on the city in the 14th century, cut off the supply of traders bringing in fresh water, and the city finally fell. It was then abandoned and swallowed by desert sand, not to be rediscovered until the 20th century. The Lost Monastery Archaeologists recently discovered the remains of a lost monastery in England. 
Researchers from the University of Reading found vestiges of timber buildings where nuns and monks had lived during the reign of medieval queen Synthrith. Synthrith ruled in the 7th century AD as the queen consort to King Offa of Mercia. Historians have often referred to Offa and Synthrith as the ultimate power couple of 7th century England. She was also one of the only female leaders of that time to get her face stamped on coins. She was such an influential figure that she was recognized by powerful European leaders like Emperor Charlemagne. Together, they ruled much of England with a pair of iron fists. But then something strange happened. King Offa died in 796 and Synethrith stopped being queen. She abandoned the throne, joined a religious order, and hid away at a monastery. Researchers believe it was this very monastery where the queen spent her final years. However, we don't know what exactly she was doing at this monastery. Maybe the former queen became a nun, or maybe she just wanted to live out her last days in peace. Alien Invasion A tiny creature was just discovered in Russia that has experts completely baffled. At first glance, it looks like an alien, like the corpse of an extraterrestrial that was ejected from its flaming ship as it crash-landed. The weird organism is very small, only about an inch long, and was found in the town of Sosnovi Bor by a local woman who went swimming in the river. According to the local television news report, the woman, named Tamara, thought she had found a mutant chicken embryo. The creature has an elongated skull, it's strangely shrunken and misshapen, and has taloned limbs. The creature was so bizarre that not even local scientists could identify it. Biologist Yegor Zadarif from the Krasnoyarsk Institute of Biophysics said it definitely wasn't a type of fish or a bird. The skull was unlike anything experts had ever seen, and it didn't appear to have wings or even really a neck. This strange little monster was taken away for analysis, and that was the last we ever saw of it. Nobody knows if it was taken to a secret underground bunker or a government laboratory. All we know is that a woman found some kind of tiny alien in the river, and it was taken away to be studied. What do you think it was? Let us know in the comments below! The Roman Giant The first ever skeleton with gigantism was discovered buried in Rome. The giant skeleton was found in 1991 during the excavation of an ancient Roman cemetery. He lived in the 3rd century AD during a time when most average men were under 6 feet tall. And yet this man was 6 feet 8 inches and would have towered over every other Roman citizen as a frightening giant. Researchers say he likely suffered from gigantism, an extremely rare condition that affects only 3 out of 1 million people worldwide. It's caused by the pituitary gland forcing a person to grow abnormally large. There have been two other giant skeletons found, one in Poland and one in Egypt, and researchers suspect they had gigantism as well. However, study leader Simona Minozzi from the University of Pisa says the Roman specimen is the only clear case of gigantism. The team from the university investigated the skeletal remains and found skull damage consistent with a pituitary tumor. This could have been what caused an overproduction of growth hormones. They also found disproportionately long limbs and evidence that the bones were still growing even into adulthood. The person most likely died between the ages of 16 and 20, likely from cardiovascular disease and respiratory issues. While some scientists say the giant Roman was nothing but a medical anomaly, others say he is evidence of an extinct species of massive human, real giants who lived 2,000 years ago. Markawasi Markawasi is a mysterious plateau high in the Andes Mountains, near the bank of the Rimac River. The mountains here rise 13,000 feet above sea level, and the whole place is an enigma. Markawasi was first investigated during the 1950s by local experts, who found hundreds of bizarre shapes carved into the rocks. Some experts say the shapes are natural formations caused by erosion while others believe the rocks were shaped by human hands. Some call Markawasi a stone forest because of all the towering geological formations. 
Granite rocks found here resemble human faces, distinctive religious symbols, and some look like animals. The region is also dotted with ancient tombs, mysterious ruins, and over 50 pre-Columbian structures that have been reduced to piles of rubble. Almost everything here remains a mystery. Some claim the plateau is rich in healing energy, while others say it's a meeting place between humans and extraterrestrials. To make things even stranger, some of the crumbling ruins appear to have doorways that are only about three feet tall, suggesting they were occupied by tiny unknown beings. It's never been confirmed, but there are a lot of people who think Markawasi was a high-altitude village of minuscule creatures no taller than two and a half feet. It could have been a type of primitive human, but it could have also been an entirely unknown species, possibly extraterrestrial. The Missing Foot A missing foot in Indonesia may just be flipping everything we know about human history on its head. There is a huge cave in Borneo, in the remote Indonesian jungle that was occupied by humans 31,000 years ago. The cave is massive, with a large main cavern about the size of a cathedral. And it was in this cathedral-like cavern that a team of scientists spent 11 days excavating a skeleton that was carefully buried. But there was one piece that was mysteriously missing, the left foot. It wasn't until the researchers inspected the nub at the bottom of the left leg that they realized what had happened. The foot had been amputated. Researchers found bone growth over a clean cut on the lower leg, suggesting a successful amputation. The reason the discovery is so crazy and could change history is that it's the earliest amputation ever found, 20,000 years earlier than any other. Researchers learned the skeleton belonged to a child, likely 9 or 10 years old, when they had their foot amputated. But they lived for another decade, until they were almost 20. Tim Maloney from Griffith University in Queensland, Australia, says the discovery essentially rewrites the known history of human medicine. Humans were believed to have been nomadic hunters and gatherers until about 10,000 years ago. But 31,000 years ago in Indonesia, they were already practicing advanced surgical techniques. When would they have had the time to learn how to perform surgeries if they were busy hunting and gathering? It's almost as if humans had a sophisticated medical knowledge and the skills to match long before the Neolithic farming transition. But where did they learn these skills and how did they develop the tools to successfully cut someone's limb off? That was almost always a death sentence due to infection and trauma. So this surgery remains a mystery. Ancient Nanostructures In 1991, some extremely strange artifacts were found in Russia, deep in the Ural Mountains. The artifacts were small, shaped like coils, and almost looked like small pieces of machinery. These strange artifacts were made about 300,000 years ago and appeared to be evidence of a culture capable of creating nanotechnology. The objects were first found by workers searching for gold in the mountains. They uncovered coils, spirals, shafts, and other tiny components that appear to have been once been part of a machine. The artifacts were clearly manufactured, with the biggest being 1.18 inches. The only thing they really resemble are miniature components found in the most advanced pieces of nanotech around today. Some of the objects are made from copper, but others are made from tungsten and other materials. Everything about this discovery is confusing. Some experts have suggested these small objects were scattered across the mountains during test rockets launched from a Russian space station. However, that most likely isn't the case. The components are far too old. They were found under the surface between 10 and 40 feet, in layers of geological stratus upwards of 318,000 years old. To this day, nobody knows how the artifacts were made or where they came from. Ancient Origins reports that some believe that the coils prove the human race enjoyed a sophisticated level of technology in the Pleistocene era, while others say that the findings are the work of extraterrestrials. What happened to Neanderthals? For 350,000 years, Neanderthals were the dominant humanoid species throughout Europe and Asia. 
They dominated the landscape up until about 40,000 years ago, when Homo sapiens came out of Africa and started spreading throughout the rest of the world. This is unlikely to be a coincidence. The evolution of modern humans almost immediately caused the destruction of the Neanderthals. What scientists have been trying to figure out for decades is why this happened. Now it looks like ancient weapons discovered in old caves in Europe could hold the answers to questions we've been asking for decades. These new discoveries could change the way we see the history of prehistoric people. During the reign of the Neanderthals, there were a few other hominid species around as well. There were Denisovans in Asia and Homo floresiensis in Indonesia. But we know more about Neanderthals because they were the most prevalent. For example, many human populations alive today have up to 3% Neanderthal DNA. Some speculate Homo sapiens bred so much with Neanderthals that we basically morphed into one species. Others speculate our enhanced aggression led us to violently eradicate the entire Neanderthal species. Scientists from the University of Bologna in Italy recently analyzed weapons used by Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. They specifically examined a period of roughly 3,000 years when these two populations likely coexisted. What they found particularly interesting was that Homo sapiens in Italy had a very specific type of technology they used. They had something the Neanderthals did not – the arrow. It's very possible that Homo sapiens developed projectile weapons way ahead of Neanderthals, and they used this advanced technology to kill off the competition. Sailing to America There are so many coastal archaeological sites in North America that it would blow your mind. Professor Matthew Deloriers from the California State University has discovered 15 early sites along the west coast of America, some of them dating to over 13,000 years old. These archaeological sites were some of the first places the early coastal people lived in North America. But just how is this discovery supposed to change the world? These coastal settlements support a new and radical viewpoint of how people came to America. Up until now, archaeologists had a one-track hypothesis. They all believed there was a gap in the glaciers far to the north, and that early humans migrated from Europe and Asia into Canada across a land bridge over the Bering Strait. This was estimated to have happened roughly 16,000 years ago, and from there, the people moved down the Pacific coast all the way to Patagonia. If you think about it, that would have taken a lot of work. People would have walked all the way from the top of the world to the bottom of the world seemingly for no other reason than to keep walking. But these coastal settlements are showing us something altogether different. It looks like humans may have sailed to North America in primitive boats, landed at random intervals up and down the coast, and then spread inland over time. The Star Child Skull A mysterious skull that was discovered supposedly has extraterrestrial origins. Researcher Lloyd Pye obtained the skull from a couple named Ray and Melanie Young from El Paso, Texas. They claimed the mysterious skull was found in 1930, roughly 100 miles from Chihuahua, Mexico, buried underground in a mine tunnel. The skull made its way to Texas, and in February of 1999, the couple handed the skull over to Lloyd. Lloyd immediately claimed that the skull belonged to an extraterrestrial human hybrid. The weird thing about the skull was that it was supposedly found lying next to a seemingly normal human skeleton. Yet the skull was anything but human, weirdly malformed and looking as though it belonged to a being with an extra large head. The skull was examined and found to belong to a child roughly five years old. However, the interior of the star child skull was extraordinary. It had an interior of 1600 cubic centimeters, significantly larger than the average adult brain. In other words, the space inside the skull was already bigger than that of an ordinary human adult skull, and the brain inside would have been tremendous. The back of the skull was also flattened, and there were no frontal sinuses. Lloyd Pye was convinced the star child skull offered evidence of a hybrid child born from an extraterrestrial and a human female. However, of course, that's never been confirmed. Most medical experts believe the child was totally human, 
and suffered from congenital hydrocephalus, which causes cranial deformations. The Mysterious Shipwreck In 1984, an American archaeologist claimed that he discovered a Roman shipwreck off the coast of Brazil. This shipwreck would have changed history as we know it. But in response, Brazil issued a national ban against underwater exploration. To take things even further, the archaeologist and treasure hunter Robert Marx accused the Brazilian government of sending their navy to dump a thick layer of sand onto the remains of the ship. They did this to hide the potentially world-changing discovery. The diver was banned from entering the country and nobody was allowed to go snooping around for underwater treasure. But why would Brazil do this? It's because if Marx truly had discovered a Roman ship from 1700 years ago, it would have shifted the accepted history of Brazil. According to politicians, the Brazilian church and everyone in charge, Brazil was discovered by Portuguese explorer Pedro Álvarez Cabral in 1500. If Brazil was instead found by the Romans much earlier, it would be a big blow to nationalism. I don't know if all of this is true, but you know. In the end, the ship was never fully uncovered, and Brazil denied any involvement in a cover-up. We still don't know if the Portuguese discovered Brazil first, or if it was the Romans. Mystery Ancestor Have you done a DNA test? Well, it turns out that you may be carrying around some mysterious DNA left behind by a very obscure ancestor. New research has identified genes in our DNA left behind by an ancient hominin species. According to Life Science, this ancestor could be Homo erectus, but no one knows for sure. It could be anything. Researchers say that the genome of that extinct lost species has never been sequenced. So, what was happening with our ancient human ancestors? Interbreeding among all the human species was going on for thousands of years, creating a complex web in our history. Biologists looked at a bunch of different factors and investigated the biological makeup of Neanderthals, Denisovans, modern humans, and modern-day Africans. The reason Africans were specifically chosen is because modern people in Africa don't have Neanderthal genes from the period of interbreeding about 50,000 years ago. When modern humans left Africa, they interbred with Neanderthals in Europe, but the humans who stayed in Africa never did, and so they didn't get the mixed Neanderthal DNA. What scientists discovered from this study is that there was some kind of mating event prior to humans leaving Africa and breeding with Neanderthals. There's an unknown ancestor, someone who nested their DNA into our own roughly one million years ago. However, scientists have no clue who this ancestor was. They don't know if it was Homo erectus or some other life form, but something is there in our DNA that is still a mystery. The Ancient Reptilian Overlords Archaeologists excavating the ancient site of Tel al-Ubaid in Iraq made one of the most shocking discoveries of the early 20th century. Artifacts were uncovered from 7,000 years ago, artifacts which appear to depict bizarre, alien-like humanoid beings with reptilian features. These figures weren't made by any of the famous Mesopotamian civilizations you might be familiar with. Instead, it was the prehistoric Ubaid culture who was responsible for crafting them. This culture goes as far back as 5500 BC, but their origins are not entirely known. They likely lived in a large village settlement with houses built from mud and brick. They developed architecture, at least in its basic form, and learned how to farm using irrigation. But it's the artifacts of the reptilians that really have researchers scratching their heads. There were plenty of agricultural civilizations at the dawn of humanity, but none except the Ubaid culture worshipped lizard gods. The figurines are all very similar, showing reptilian humanoids with nearly identical features. Some are male and some are female, some are holding babies, and others are gripping staffs and wearing what appear to be crowns. These lizard beings were clearly very important to the Ubaid culture, almost certainly worshipped religiously but nobody knows what they really were. We don't know if these creatures were fictional gods, alien beings who came down from the stars, or a race of subterranean lizard people who have since gone extinct. The Fart God For thousands of years before Europeans invaded North America, 
the Innu people of northern Quebec hunted moose and deer, farmed the land, and fished. They were among the first indigenous people to call the area home. Like most groups of Native Americans, the Innu worshipped animal gods and honored the spirits of all living things. One of the stranger deities worshipped by the Innu was Machishishkapeu, the fart god. It was said that Machishkapeu existed everywhere and was omnipresent, always with you no matter where you traveled. He was a bizarre personification of the human fart. When somebody passed gas, the Innu believed it was the fart god trying to communicate. Machishkapeu wasn't just a fringe deity either, he was incredibly important. He offered humor in times of hardship, and if he made himself known during a great hunt, that could be interpreted in pretty much any way. It was said the fart god was one of the most powerful in the Innu world, even overpowering the caribou master by cursing him with constipation. The Innu also believed the only way to truly understand what the fart god was trying to say was by concentrating whenever he made himself known. In other words, whenever somebody passed gas, they had to stop and try to decipher what the omnipresent deity in their rear end was trying to tell them. The Celestial Deities of the Maya There is no denying that the ancient Maya loved the stars. They observed and interpreted every aspect of the sky they could. It was from these celestial objects, things like the stars, the moon, and the other planets in the solar system, that most of their deities were born. For the Maya, the Earth was the center of everything. Over 1,500 years after the Maya were gone, Christian leaders held the same belief. The only difference was that the Maya worshipped celestial objects. They didn't have one mighty god, but many mighty gods. As they watched the glowing objects in the sky move from one place to another, they interpreted that as the gods traveling to different realms. There was Kinich Ahau, the sun god who shined in the sky all day. He was such an important figure that many Maya rulers claimed that they were descendants of the sun itself. Kinich was both the blazing sun and a human-like deity who could make babies. Then there was the moon goddess Ixchel. Like many other ancient cultures, the day and night cycle was explained by the moon constantly being at war with the sun. Every night, Ixchel defeated Kenich Ahau and banished him to the underworld, and in the morning, their places were reversed. Shila Na Gig The Shila Na Gigs are strange medieval carvings with a mostly unknown history. They can be found all across Europe in medieval churches, castles, and gateposts all the way from Ireland to Spain. The carvings are small stone statues and figures depicting a woman squatting, gesturing, growling, and displaying her private parts in such a way that even these days would be considered over the top. Because of the subject matter of these statues, the church has been trying to get rid of them for centuries. Nobody knows exactly how many of the Shila Na gigs were in Europe in the Middle Ages. The church almost certainly destroyed a huge percentage of them. There are only a handful left now, with the majority being found in Ireland. We also don't know where they came from or what they are supposed to represent. Some experts have speculated they were idols worshipped by a pagan cult obsessed with females and reproduction. Others have suggested these sculptures were symbols of fertility, perhaps used in ancient birthing rituals. Some say they were used to ward off the devil, while others say it was the church who initially built them as a warning against committing sins. The Mystery Gods of the San Xing Dui the culture at San Xingdui lived in China's central plains about 5,000 years ago. The first trace of them was discovered in 1929 near the village of Guanghan. A father and son were digging a well when they came across a sacrificial pit containing unimaginable treasure. They found relics made of gold, jade, and bronze. These artifacts came from the kingdom of Shu, who lived in their mighty capital of San Xingdui. They were the most advanced culture in Asia at the time, at the forefront of technological innovation and architectural advancement for 2,000 years. And yet the civilization didn't leave any written evidence of their beliefs behind. For this reason, all we know about the Bronze Age Kingdom of Shu is based on artifacts. The artifacts found in this ancient city are unlike anything found in China. 
specifically the weird idols of alien-like creatures with oddly proportioned heads and massive bulging eyeballs. The culture here appeared to have worshipped these figures, although nobody is sure what they were meant to represent. They weren't quite lizard people, but they weren't entirely human either. Even more bizarre is that the people at San Xingdui were carving bronze statues of their deities 1,000 years before anyone else in China carved any kind of humanoid statue. Big shout out to Will Ha and Anthony. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, welcome, and be sure to subscribe to join the Origins Explained family. The Toilet Goddess Before the Romans, the Etruscans ruled most of northern and central Italy. No one really knows where the Etruscans came from, but they were already established at least by 700 BC. It was only with the rise of the Roman Republic that the Etruscans lost their power. By the year 264 BC, the Etruscans were assimilated into Rome. Many of their beliefs, ideas, and cultural aspects were also absorbed into the Roman Republic. Etruscan legends became Roman legends. One of these legends was of Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, who ruled from between 616 and 579 BC. He has been credited with building the Cloaca Maxima, the greatest sewer system the ancient world ever saw. It was an immense system of canals and drains designed to prevent the capital from flooding and to move sewage away from civilized neighborhoods. After the creation of the Great Sewer, the Etruscans began worshipping one of the strangest goddesses in history. Her name was Cloacina, and she was the goddess of the toilet. Worship of the toilet goddess continued after the fall of the Etruscans and lasted long into the Roman Republic, with the Romans even building shrines to their obscure sewer deity. She was officially the goddess of the toilet, the sewer, and general filth. The Anunnaki the Anunnaki were the gods of ancient Mesopotamia. These mysterious beings were worshipped thousands of years before the Christians had angels, before the Greeks had Zeus, and before the Egyptians had Osiris. They have even been found on carvings and reliefs all over the ancient lands of Mesopotamia. They are often depicted as humans with wings, horned hats, and magical abilities. The Sumerians believed the Anunnaki had come from the heavens to help shape human society. But what were these deities really? Were they the first pantheon of gods, no different from the gods worshipped by the Romans? Or were they truly a race of exceptional humans from another planet? What we know is that the Anunnaki were the principal gods between roughly 4500 and 1750 BC. They were worshipped by the Sumerians, an early civilization that lived in modern Iraq and Iran. The ancient civilization was responsible for some of the most impressive technological advancements of their day. They invented the plow, developed the earliest known system of writing, cuneiform script, and they even came up with a way to keep track of time, which humans still use today. But according to the Sumerians themselves, this was only possible with help from the Anunnaki. Their mythology says that the Anunnaki descended from a supreme deity named An, and were tasked with bringing humanity out of the Dark Ages and teaching them how to form civilized societies. Some speculate the Anunnaki weren't deities, but real aliens who bestowed knowledge on primitive humans to help them advance and evolve. Baphomet and the Knights Templar Baphomet is not the devil, contrary to popular belief. If modern scholars are correct, he was never any kind of anything. The origin of the name can be traced back to the Holy Land in 1098. While the Christian Crusaders were fighting against the Islamic warriors, they thought the Islamists were calling upon a creature known as Baphomet. However, modern scholars believe it was a misinterpretation of the name Muhammad. Whatever the case, the Knights Templar brought back tales of this mysterious deity and allegedly began to worship it themselves. When the Knights Templar were brought up on charges of heresy in the 14th century, they were accused of worshipping the goat-headed Baphomet as a false idol. Philip IV, King of France, was in serious financial debt to the order as a result of a war with England. He hoped to have his debt erased, but at the same time feared the military might of the Templars. Therefore, he decided to have them arrested and charged with heresy. They were then burned alive every last one the church could get their hands on. 
This is a fascinating case study in how a mispronounced or misinterpreted word turned into a demonic being from hell. Baphomet has never in a thousand years gone away from popular culture. 200 years after somebody heard the name of the supposed demon screamed on a battlefield, Baphomet was used to milk false confessions out of the Knights Templar. It was all so that Philip IV could execute them and steal their money. And in 1854, French magician Eliphas Levi brought Baphomet back into the spotlight by giving it male and female physical parts. He gave Baphomet the head of a goat and turned it into a magical icon. These days, people assume Baphomet is another guise for Satan. Meteorite Worship Ancient cultures all over the world were obsessed with meteorites. When early civilizations began to emerge, they believed that rocks that fell to the earth from space contained mystical powers and were capable of bestowing divine blessings. In ancient Egypt, they believed in star metal and learned how to make iron out of meteorites. They would use the metal extracted from space rocks to create extremely significant items, things with ceremonial and religious importance. The Egyptians, according to experts Thomas Brophy and Robert Bauval, who wrote a book on the subject, believed meteorites contained the very material that the heavens were made of. Ancient Egyptians also believed that their pharaohs were made from the same stuff. Ancient texts and pyramids have found descriptions of pharaohs as star gods, claiming their bones were made from iron and that their very bodies were made from the stars themselves. The Egyptians made amulets and special objects for meteorites for about 2,000 years before they realized they could mine iron from the ground they walked on. The Wand Gina Sky Being There are strange images drawn on cliffs and cave walls throughout western Kimberley, Australia. These drawings depict what is called the Wand Gina Sky Being, and there are thousands of them. To the Aboriginal Australians thousands of years ago, the Wangina was a supreme being not unlike the biblical god. Wangina was said to have created Australia, handed down the law of the land to the people, and forced the aboriginals to obey its every word. At least that's the official story behind these curious ancient artworks. The first discovery of the Wangina sky being by outsiders was in 1837. The explorer George Grey was on an expedition to the northwest of Australia a mission sponsored by the Royal Geographical Society, when he came across the Wangina pictures in a cave. George copied what he found on the cave walls into his journal and then published them when he returned to Great Britain. The pictures caught the world's attention because they were unlike any other cave drawings anyone had ever seen, even in Australia. Rock art was already pretty famous, but there was nothing like the Wangina. The pictures immediately fueled a theory about aliens. There is no denying that the pictures of Wangina, which to the aboriginals was a supreme and omnipresent being, look like extraterrestrials. The aboriginals drew thousands of pictures of the Wangina, making it seem as though there had been thousands of these bizarre entities. People started wondering if aliens hadn't come down to Western Australia in the past and revealed themselves to the natives. Speculation began to swirl that the indigenous populations had been worshipping divine creatures from outer space with huge eyes and strange bodies. In reality, the Wangina sky being was only a singular being, an almighty god that created the world and lorded over everything in it. The Black Knights In the 13th century, legends began to spread across Europe of a mysterious order of Black Knights. Nobody knows where exactly these stories came from, but suddenly black knights were a staple in local folklore. These knights supposedly carried out good deeds, protected cities from corrupt kings, and fought against evil. Stories about black knights became so ingrained in society that the church banned texts talking about them during the Middle Ages. It's hard to say who the first legendary black knight was, but one of the first was definitely Asher the Kingkiller. According to legend, 
Ashur was an older knight who had a nasty reputation of slaying kings, nobles, and beating other knights in sword fights. In the 13th century, a king ordered Ashur to his court and gave the order to kill his nemesis. Ashur agreed to kill the other king, and then he ended up on a bit of an adventure involving a priest in a dungeon, a demon, an angel, and a mysterious entity known as the Anonymous One. The story ends with Asher being granted immortality for his stout heart and good deeds. And while there is a chance this person never existed, the story inspired hundreds of copies. It got to the point medieval people really believed there were black knights riding around everywhere. The Philosopher's Stone If you're familiar with the Philosopher's Stone, it's probably because of a certain book about young wizards. But the Philosopher's Stone was a very real legend in the Middle Ages. All the way until the 17th century, alchemists, sorcerers, and medieval maniacs tried desperately to get their hands on it. According to the legends, the Philosopher's Stone had the power to turn boring metals like zinc or copper into gold. It was also believed the Philosopher's Stone could cure any illness, give immortality, and bestow a person with eternal youth. But just what in the world was the Philosopher's Stone? Contrary to popular belief, it was not a physical stone. It was believed to be a mineral, some kind of substance that could be put into elixirs and used in alchemical reactions. Early scientists truly thought there was a special mineral somewhere that would give them ultimate power. Some of the world's greatest minds even went searching for the magical stone. Roger Boyle and Isaac Newton believed in it, and Nicholas Flamel even claimed that he used the Philosopher's Stone to transform lead into gold. But as far as modern science is concerned, the Philosopher's Stone has never existed. Do you think something like this could actually exist? Let me know your thoughts in the comments! Big shout out to Lara Ashley Davis and Ubaldo Myers! Thanks so much for watching and supporting this channel! We wouldn't be here without you! If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family! The Legend of Magonia People used to believe in a mysterious cloud realm hovering above the physical Earth. This realm in the sky, an actual civilization in the clouds, was called Magonia. But all we really know about this mysterious place comes from a Spanish-born priest who wrote down its details 1,200 years ago. His name is Agobard of Lyon, and he was a Carolingian bishop in the early 800s. He was also the author of many treatises, covering subject matter like Spanish adoptionism, Jewish religious practices, and political controversies of his day. He was quite the intellectual. Among all these seemingly ordinary writings, Agobard wrote about a hidden cloud realm in the sky, and something he called weather magic. It's a pretty big jump to go from politics to magic, but this was the 9th century. Agobard was openly against all pagan practices. When he wrote his treatise against weather magic and the mysterious stormland of Magonia, he did so to denounce it. He mentioned a popular belief from sailors and pirates who came down from the realm in the sky to pillage and plunder. Apparently, if Agobard's complaining is to be believed, people around him were talking about how the cloud people of Magonia were creating storms that ruined crops with their sky magic, and then they would come down and steal all their stuff. This is a really weird medieval mystery because we don't have any other records of Magonia. This singular bishop appears to be the only one who ever wrote anything about it. Yet according to his own words, people he knew believed in a realm in the clouds, and they even had pirates who came down in flying ships. Have you heard of this mysterious cloud realm before? Let me know in the comments! The Werewolf Trials Long before America had an obsession with witch hunts, Europe was in the throes of their own werewolf hysteria. In Germany in 1589, executioners strapped a man named Peter Stump to a big wooden wheel, removed pieces of his skin with hot pincers, and then took off his head. His head was then put on a spike to warn locals not to associate themselves with the devil. Peter's only crime was being weird, but back then, anything weird or different was satanic and deserved to be punished. Everyone thought he was a werewolf. 
But he was hardly the only one who was accused of turning into a werewolf at night and stalking the countryside. Werewolf trials were popular in Europe for about 300 years. They continued until the 17th century, which strangely enough was when folks got on the witch hunt bandwagon. Right when werewolf trials stopped, witchcraft trials began. Almost anyone could be accused of turning into a werewolf. It was mostly beggars, hermits, newly arrived immigrants from parts unknown, and others who didn't quite fit into society. If you acted unusual, you could find yourself being flayed alive. The Strangeness of Jane Shore Elizabeth Jane Shore is still famous centuries after her death for being one of the mistresses of King Edward IV of England. She remained famous when most of his other mistresses were lost to obscurity because of her charm, influence, and outrageous behavior. She captivated the people, was one of the king's favorite lovers, and she even used her influence to protect those King Edward would have otherwise destroyed. After Edward's death, things got nasty. Elizabeth Jane Shore was accused by Richard III of being a harlot. As punishment for her lewdness, she was made to strip down to her underwear and walk through the streets of London. She had to do history's most famous walk of shame. Elizabeth was born in London in 1445 as the daughter of a wealthy merchant. From birth, Elizabeth was part of high society. She was also exceptionally brilliant. At 15, she was married to a man named William Shore. A few years later, in 1476, she was given an annulment by Pope Sixtus IV because her husband was impotent and couldn't perform his marital duties. Right from the start, Elizabeth had great aspirations and could not be held back in life. Her husband just didn't cut it. These aspirations and her unyielding determination for something greater brought Elizabeth in contact with the king. She remained by his side until 1483 when he died. She then tried to stay in the English court by quickly becoming the mistress of Thomas Grey, who was the son of Edward IV's true queen with her previous husband. Elizabeth also had another lover in court, something like a backup guy who would keep her safe from harm. But none of that mattered when Richard III decided he had it out for her. Richard had her backup lover executed and even accused Elizabeth of witchcraft. Her relatives were murdered and she was forced to walk through London in her underpants. Her power was just too much, and the fact that she'd been loyal to the previous king made her an enemy of the state. Elizabeth Jane Shore died many years later in obscurity at the age of 82. The Eruption of Mount Etna On March 8, 1669, the most volatile active volcano in the world erupted on the island of Sicily. It's called Mount Etna, and four centuries ago, its explosion was one of the biggest volcanic events in modern human history. 20,000 people were killed, and thousands more were left homeless. Most people in the shadow of the mountain fled to escape being burned alive by lava, but there were a few who stayed and tried to fight the volcano. The first record we have of Mount Etna erupting comes from 475 BC. It's believed to be the most active volcano in Europe. It erupted in 1169 as well, killing about 15,000 people in Sicily. Despite the danger the mountain obviously presents, villages re-emerged and people moved back in. Finally, in 1669, the volcano did it again. When it began to belch gas, noxious fumes, and fire, 3,000 people who were living on the slopes of the mountain died immediately. There were about 20,000 people living in the nearby city of Catania, and instead of leaving, they sent a team of 50 men to divert the approaching lava flow. These men fought the lava with iron rods and shovels, trying to redirect the flow like they might redirect a flooding river. It worked surprisingly well, but not that well. People tried to divert the lava for weeks, while the people of Catania patiently waited. Then, at last, the lava flowed into the medieval city and everyone was killed because nobody bothered to evacuate. Would you ever live near an active volcano? Let me know in the comments and remember to subscribe if you haven't already! The Rat Catcher one of the most despicable jobs you could get in medieval times was to run around chasing rats. Cities in the Middle Ages were so disgusting they were infested with vermin. There were so many rats and disease-spreading animals in Europe that it became a lucrative business to exterminate them. Poor people who had no other opportunities in life would chase rats through the sewers so that they could make a few extra bucks. 
The profession of catching rats started with the onset of the Black Death in the 1300s and reached its peak in Victorian England during the 19th century. Rat catchers began at the very bottom of society, trudging through muck and slime and filth to catch as many rats as they could. But they eventually became modern exterminators. Lowly rat catchers evolved to become real exterminators, not just sewer-dwelling rat grabbers. The things in the rat world weren't always as simple as they might seem. People weren't really crawling on their hands and knees through sewer pipes to kill rats. They had dogs and ferrets that would do it for them. Rat catchers became so good at exterminating vermin that they would even breed rats and release them so they could make more money. Rat catchers also started breeding what they called fancy rats. These were pets sold to rich people in London, increasing their pay even more. What started as a necessity in the Middle Ages became a huge business. In 1901, there was even the National Mouse Club, a sort of fan club for fancy rats. The Forgotten Killer Du Chanatier was one of the earliest serial killers in recorded history. He also happened to be the king of Yemen for almost 30 years. He took the throne around 490 AD and immediately started his murder spree. Ancient historical records say he lured young boys, mostly the sons of nobles and people in the royal family, to his home with the promise of anything from food to money. He then tortured them before throwing them naked out of the window of his own house. He was one of the most outrageous royal serial killers because he didn't even try to hide what he was doing. The king only stopped when someone got so angry that they went up to his building and assassinated him. After he was killed, Du Chanatier's head was displayed for everyone to see in the palace window. It's still unclear how such a maniac made it on the throne or why he lasted 27 years before someone finally got rid of him. The Book of Beasts Breeding material in the medieval period was not exactly as widespread or diverse as it is today. During the Middle Ages in Europe, you couldn't just walk into a convenience store and grab a book off the shelf. They didn't have a wall section of books at your local donkey cart station. What they did have was a very select few books that were passed around and shared. Most of the books were religious in nature, but one of them was more exciting than any other. Forget about the Bible. People in the medieval world wanted their own copy of the bestiary. The bestiary was by far one of the most popular illustrated texts in Europe. From between 500 and 1500, the bestiary was almost more popular than the Bible, although it still had its ties to the good book. Medieval Christians believed all the creatures they saw in the bestiary were manifestations of God. The book didn't just showcase incredible animals from across the world that most medieval peasants would never see, but it also gave them each a special religious meaning. The bestiary was the earliest version of the Nature Channel. This would have been the one and only chance people had of looking at animals from faraway lands. People would have been gobsmacked by pictures of giraffes, elephants, weird birds, monkeys, and all kinds of other creatures. This was a major source of entertainment, and it was all because of the beautiful visuals inside the book. The bestiary even became the basis for natural history as a science. Unicorn Horn the bestiary book showed a lot of real animals and some that didn't quite exist. For example, the unicorn. The unicorn was one of the most favorite animals of the Middle Ages, even though there is no evidence it ever existed. But just like how people might believe whatever they see on the internet today, most medieval people believe the animals in their bestiaries were real. And that brings us to King Henry and his fascination with the mythical unicorn. Long before the Middle Ages, people believed certain animals, objects, and ingredients had magical properties. The rarer the creature, the more valuable their hide, horn, or whatever body parts they had that looked magical. No animal was believed to be more magical than the unicorn. Corn. It likely all started with the Vikings 1,000 years ago. Vikings frequently found narwhal tusks washed on the beach and sold them as magical unicorn horns. This undoubtedly started a trend in which the most powerful European rulers tried desperately to get their hands on one of these legendary horns. 
1533, King Francis I of France was given a horn coated in gold from Pope Clement VII. Philip II of Spain supposedly had 12 staffs made from unicorn horn. And in the 1600s, Christian V of Denmark sat on a throne made entirely of unicorn horns. Even the seemingly rational Queen Elizabeth I of England once purchased a spiral unicorn horn for 10,000 pounds. Historical expert Eleanor Herman says Queen Elizabeth drank from a unicorn horn cup. The queen believed that if anyone tried to poison her, the unicorn horn would explode and save her life. Keep in mind that 10,000 pounds back in the day would be equal to 1.3 million pounds now. For rich, wealthy royals, unicorn horns were definitely real. Thanks for watching. What do you think is the craziest thing medieval people believed in? The cryptos. One of the most mysterious undeciphered codes in the world is a puzzle that sits right outside the CIA's cafeteria at their headquarters in Langley, Virginia. It's a sculpture called Cryptos, and it was constructed in 1991. The code consists of 865 letters and four random question marks, and the whole thing is stamped into a curving wall of copper. And although three passages were successfully decoded soon after the sculpture was first built, it hasn't been finished. The fourth and final section has proved so hard that it's been 30 years and still, the brightest minds in the world have yet to solve it. But sculptor Jim Sanborn, the man behind the code, recently came forward to give a clue. He released two previous hints, one in 2010 and another in 2014. But even with two clues, nobody was ever able to decipher Kryptos. His new clue, which is the third and final clue he's given to help unravel the 97-character passage, is Northeast. The first three passages were solved by CIA physicist David Stein in 1998. He did it using nothing but pencil and paper to figure out the cipher and crack the code. Around the same time, a computer scientist named Jim Gallotley cracked the code using a computer program. However, the fourth passage in the puzzle eluded them both. But why is this code so difficult to unravel? It's likely because Jim Sanborn used an ordinary cipher for the first three passages and then a layered cipher for the final passage. He also used spelling errors to make it even more confusing. There are over 2,000 people online dedicated to unraveling the secrets of the code. But the CIA can't do it, and neither can top scientists and computer programmers. If they can't do it soon, Jim Sanborn might have to unveil another clue. The Sator Square The Sator Square, also called the Templar Magic Square, is a very unusual mystery. Starting around the 1st century AD, these squares began to show up all across the ancient world. Each square is a two-dimensional word square that contains five rows and five columns of Latin letters. There are five words inside the box. Sator, Arepo, Tenet, Opera, and Rotas. They are positioned in such a way to create palindromes, with Tenet being at the very center of the puzzle. The reason these word squares are so strange is that nobody knows what they mean, why they were made, or how they ended up scratched into clay roof tiles from England all the way to North Africa. These things have also been found in Syria, Sweden, and across Europe. The earliest we know of is a satyr square etched onto a column in Pompeii. Another was located in the Basilica di Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. And the Castle of Rochemar in France has a satyr square too. This mystery is more baffling than most from the ancient world, especially because there are no written records of what a satyr square was. We know that satyr was often used to reference Jupiter, the Roman version of ancient Greece's Zeus. But the other words don't make much sense. Nobody knows what Arepo means, although it could be somebody's name. Tenet has a word that means to hold, while opera could mean with care. Though do keep in mind these are just educated guesses. Some believe the sentence inside the box could read, The sower Arepo holds the wheels with care. But if that's correct, why in the world was such a simple sentence written all over the world in such a cryptic way? Why was it written on ancient scraps of papyrus, etched into clay tablets, and even fashioned into amulets? 
That translation doesn't seem right. During the Middle Ages, people thought the Sator Square was imbued with magical powers. Some even thought it was a charm that could ward away evil and illness. In Germany, there was a disc carved with a square that locals thought could put out fires. What do you think it means? Let me know in the comments. Big shout out to Amanda Marshall, thank you, and Harry TV HMN, who is a new subscriber. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. We'd love to have you. The Somerton Man Code. On December 1st, 1948, an unidentified man's body was found on the beach at Somerton Park, which is located in a suburb of Adelaide, Australia. Inside the pocket of the man's pants was a mysterious scrap of paper with the phrase Tamam Shud written on it. Translated from Persian to English, the phrase either means is finished or is over. The scrap of paper was torn from the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, an ancient book on astronomy authored in Persia in the 12th century AD. Investigators didn't know what in the world to think about this bizarre piece of paper, but they did manage to track down the book. What they found next is still baffling people to this very day. On the inside back cover of the book, detectives found a bunch of scribblings left behind in different people's handwriting. There was a local telephone number, another number that was never identified, and a text that looked like a coded message. Police puzzled over it for a very long time, but the text was never deciphered or coherently interpreted. The case is still considered one of Australia's greatest unsolved mysteries. The man was never identified, and the passage in the book was never explained. But things only get stranger the more you learn about the case. Staff at the Adelaide Railroad Station found a brown suitcase shortly after the discovery of the body. The suitcase had its label removed prior to being checked into the cloakroom, which happened just hours before the mystery man was found on the beach. It's believed that the suitcase belonged to the unidentified man, but all the tags and markings on the clothing had been meticulously removed, which meant there was no way to identify where anything came from. The only thing that wasn't removed was a name on a tie, T. Keen. Although that never proved useful because nobody named T. Keen was ever reported missing. It was probably a code name. But what does this mystery have to do with the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam? The scrap of paper with Tamam Shud written on it was stitched into a secret pocket inside the man's pants. The book the scrap came from was found randomly by a citizen in Adelaide who heard the cops were looking for it and turned it in. Nobody knows where the book came from or what its significance was. And it's still unclear as to who was leaving strange notes in the back of the book. All attempts to decode the scribblings have failed and not even the most powerful code-breaking technology has been helpful in revealing the Somerton man's secrets. Any theories about what happened to him? The Parchments of Rennes-le-Château In the late 19th century, a series of parchments were discovered in the small French community of Rennes-le-Château. The story is extremely vague, and different versions of it have different people finding the parchments. Some mention a priest named Berenguer Saunier, but others say it was a priest named Ab Saunier. Either way, the priest allegedly discovered a collection of parchment hidden underneath the floorboards of his church. The documents were believed to have been placed there by his predecessors, and by their predecessors before them, going back centuries. Some of the parchments supposedly contain genealogical information on the surviving Merovingian bloodline, the family that ruled the Franks from the 5th century up until 751 AD. Written on the parchments are also extracts from the Gospels in Latin, and some coded messages that have never been deciphered. As far as we know, the genealogical documents have remained unpublicized. Some rumors even say the documents were picked up by British intelligence and locked in a vault. In 1967, most of the coded parchments were published by Gerard de Sede. It's unclear how he came into possession of the documents, but he released them to the public in his book. One of the texts was a collection of gospel accounts of Jesus and his disciples. In 1969, Henry Lincoln discovered a hidden message inside the script. The hidden message reads, To Dagobert II, King, and to Sion is this treasure, and he is there dead. 
Dagobert II was a Merovingian king who ruled the Franks from 675 to 679 AD. The Merovingian kings were a very important bloodline in history because, according to some scholars, they were the direct descendants of Jesus Christ. The first Merovingian king was Childeric I in 481 AD. The last member of the bloodline that we know about was Theodoric IV, who died in 737 AD. If there is information about their surviving bloodline, we could identify a real, living relative of Jesus Christ. This is what makes the coded parchment so fascinating, but unfortunately very little is known about them. We don't know what the bizarre messages hidden in the scripts mean, and nobody knows how they came to be buried underneath a random church in the south of France. The Indus Valley Script It's been nearly 4,000 years since people wrote using the Indus Valley Script. It's one of the oldest written languages in the world, developed by the Indus Valley Civilization starting around 3500 BC. But since this was 5,500 years ago on the Indian subcontinent, the origin of the language is poorly understood. In fact, the ancient writing system remains undeciphered to this day. Nobody knows how to read it or how in the world to decode it. And there isn't a single bilingual text that's been found anywhere. The Indus Valley civilization spoke one language and had one system of writing. Then, when they were gone for good, so was everyone who could understand their language. The earliest examples of the Indus script were found on scraps of pottery in the ruined city of Harappa. By around 2600 BC, during the urban period, the script had morphed into its fully developed form. Longer inscriptions were recorded, and there are thousands of them spread across more than 60 excavation sites in India and Pakistan. What makes the script so strange is that most of the inscriptions that have been located are very short. Even though this was a fully functional language, the inscriptions are trivial. The ancient Egyptians wrote things down on massive lengths of papyrus and practically wrote entire books on stone monuments. Yet the Indus Valley civilization usually wrote no more than five symbols or characters at a time. And none of these inscriptions are longer than 26 signs. To this day, scientists don't understand what information they were trying to convey using such small blocks of text. Still, the Indus Valley people must have understood what was going on. Their language has been found on tablets, bones, and square stamps, as well as pieces of bronze and copper. It seems that most people could read, but they could only read one language. It also doesn't look like the culture ever allowed foreigners into their cities. Otherwise, we would have bilingual texts to help understand their forgotten language. The Degas Pfeiffer In 1939, a man named Alexander Degas Pfeiffer wrote a small book about cryptography called Codes and Ciphers. However, Alexander wasn't necessarily a cryptographical expert. On the very last page of the book, Alexander left a cipher of his very own. On page 144, he left a number cipher with an invitation for his readers to test their skills by trying to decipher it. Although it's now been almost 100 years, and nobody has ever succeeded. It's called the Degas Pfeiffer cipher, and it's remained unbroken since before the end of World War II. Not even Degas Pfeiffer himself was ever able to decode it. The problem was, he forgot so he was never able to unravel his own creation. And all of this for a clever cipher at the back of an elementary book on cryptography. A starter book that was supposedly for beginners. This isn't the only story of a self-taught cryptographer who forgot. There is another story of a spy who encrypted the locations of thousands of pages of sensitive documents he had stolen from the US government. The problem, he was dyslexic and forgot one of the cipher words he used to encrypt the location. So much for that! The Dorabella Cipher Edward Elgar sent a short, encoded letter to his friend Dora Penny in 1897. Edward's nickname for his friend was Dorabella, which is why we call it the Dorabella Cipher today. The contents of the cipher were likely nothing out of the ordinary. After all, it was a simple letter from one friend to another but Penny never figured out what the letter said. She was never able to crack the code, 
And all these years later, neither can the most sophisticated code-cracking programs. The cipher consists of 87 characters divided into three lines, broken down into 24 symbols, with all the symbols being made from semicircles. In some places, there is only one semicircle, but in other places, there are groups of three semicircles oriented at a weird angle. It's all very strange, and nobody knows what it means. Edward wasn't even a cryptographer. He was a 40-year-old music teacher who hadn't even done any successful composing. He was also in love with Dora Penny, who was 17 years younger than him. And while they never married, they did remain friends for the rest of Edward's life until his death in 1934. Although Edward wasn't famous when he wrote the cipher, he eventually composed orchestral works, such as the Pomp and Circumstance Marches and, most fitting, the Enigma Variations. When the Nazis needed a name for their code machine during World War II, they called it the Enigma Machine after Edward Elger's composition. One of the proposed solutions came from Javier Atanze, who believes the cipher is a melody instead of a text. He wasn't able to decode it, but thinks it's music, not words. In 2011, Canadian cryptographer Richard Henderson believed that he'd solved the cipher. According to him, it read, Why am I very sad, Belle? I sag as we see roses do. E.E. -E is ever fond of you, Dora. I know I pen one I love. All of my affection. Would you appreciate a letter like this? Seems like a lot of work to uncover what it says. What do you think? This solution sounds a lot better than the one proposed in 2020 by Wayne Packwood, who instead believed the code was this. A woman is exactly like chess requires that one make many sacrifices for its queen, and the reward for doing so is victory. She commands that you not do better. I think I prefer the other interpretation more. As of now, none of these solutions have ever been confirmed as correct. We still don't know what the cipher says, or why Edward thought Dora would understand it. The Ogham Alphabet There is an ancient alphabet called Ogham, and it appears on monuments and in ancient manuscripts from between the 4th and 9th centuries in Ireland. It was used as an alphabet to write extremely primitive Old Irish, along with other ancient languages of the nearby British Isles. Ogham was also used for writing Old Welsh, Latin, and Pictish. It can be found carved in stone throughout Ireland, England, Scotland, Wales, and the Isle of Man. Although the alphabet is fully decoded and there are people out there who can read it, its origins are still a mystery. Keep in mind this isn't a language but merely an alphabet. It's the same as how the Latin alphabet is used today in languages like German, Spanish, and English. Only Ogham was used about 1,600 years ago. Some believe the name came from the Irish god Ogma. We know it predates the earliest inscriptions, so it was likely already around in the 1st century AD. It may have been inspired by Roman and Greek script, or even runic symbols from Scandinavia. Researchers think it was first used to write Old Irish as a form of secret communication. It may have started as a way for people to leave messages to one another out in the wilderness that only specific people could read. However, the only surviving Ogham inscriptions are carved into solid rock, meaning it was likely more commonly inscribed onto trees and sticks. People may have used the script to mark ownership of territories and to etch names onto graves. Most Ogham is known, but there are a few even more primitive inscriptions that have yet to be deciphered particularly in Irish and Pictish. There are also a bunch of bilingual inscriptions that blend Ogham with the runic alphabet, showing how its popularity was spreading. It became such a popular alphabet that it made its way from Ireland all the way to the English countryside. The K.O. Cipher The K.O. Cipher was invented in 1918 by a man named John Byrne, and it was so insanely complicated that nobody was ever able to crack his code. However, it was so simple that its mechanism was a pair of ordinary rotating discs that could fit in a tiny cigar box. The key to what turned out to be one of the most confusing ciphers ever built was so simple it could be operated by a child. Up until just a few years ago, there were only three people on the planet capable of cracking the code. There was the inventor's surviving son, John Byrne Jr., and two editors who viewed the cipher in 1990, but were sworn to complete secrecy. 
For almost 90 years, nobody could understand how the cipher worked, and its algorithm was guarded like the secret ingredient to Coca-Cola. But then, in 2010, Patricia Byrne, John Jr.'s wife, donated all the papers and artifacts related to the cipher to the National Cryptologic Museum in Maryland. This ultimately led to the public revealing of the KO cipher algorithm. The whole thing is really simple. It works using two disks, each complete with the 26 letters of the alphabet. The disks spin, and occasionally they engage where two different letters meet. This is where the coding happens. Then the disks spin the other way, making it impossible for someone without the disks to anticipate the code. The tabs with the letters are also removable, so the disks can constantly change. The only way to break the code is by having the original disks with the letters matched in order. The device is simple, yet so effective it stumped everyone for nearly a century. Rohonk Codex The Rohonk Codex is either an extremely mysterious book in an unknown language or a sophisticated hoax from the 18th century. The illustrated manuscript has no known author and its text is written in an unknown language system. And to this day, nobody has ever been able to decode the writing inside. The text is so bizarre and confusing that most people have dismissed it as gibberish. It looks like nonsense writing, with no rhyme or reason for the way the symbols are organized. It's been investigated by a lot of scholars and even more amateurs, but nobody has ever reached a definitive conclusion. Hungarian scholars came right out and said it was a hoax, but nobody can confirm that. The truth is that we don't know where the book came from, and we know nothing about its history. One day, out of the blue, it just kind of showed up. The Rohonk Codex first appeared in Hungary in the early 19th century. It was named after the city of Rohonk where it was discovered. The book was then donated to the Hungarian Academy of Sciences in 1838 by a Hungarian count who donated the entirety of his library to the Academy before his death. He'd been holding onto the Codex for an undetermined amount of time. Nobody knows where he got it, although there was an entry in his catalog that marked the year 1743. It's believed the entry is connected to the book, but nobody knows for sure. If the Codex was a hoax, it wasn't perpetrated very well. If it had been in Count Gustav's collection since 1743, that means the Count was holding on to it, or at least his family was holding on to it, for nearly a century. It only reached the attention of the public by coincidence when staff at the Academy realized the puzzle they had before them. The Codex has since been picked apart by experts from every academic background, but nobody's made any progress with it. In 1866, historian Caroli Sabo accused the antiquarian Samuel Literati Nimes of creating the book as a joke. However, there is no proof connecting memes to the Codex, or the Codex to anyone else for that matter. Thanks for watching! Are you brave enough to take a crack at any of these codes? Let me know in the comments! Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and give this video a thumbs up for more! See you later! Bye!